chapter 2 in a giant empty decaying building which had once housed thousands a single TV set hawked its wares to an uninhabited room this ownerless ruin had before World War Terminus been tended and maintained here had been the suburbs of San Francisco a short ride by monorail rapid transit the entire peninsula had chattered like a bird tree with life and opinions and complaints and now the watchful owners had either died or migrated to a colony world mostly the former it had been a costly war despite the valiant predictions of the pentagon and its smug scientific vassal the Rand Corporation, which had in fact existed not far from this spot. Like the apartment owners, the corporation had departed, evidently for good. No one missed it. In addition, no one today remembered why the war had come about or who, if anyone, had won. The dust, which had contaminated most of the planet's surface, had originated in no country, and no one, even the wartime enemy, had planned on it. First, strangely, the owls had died. At the time, it had seemed almost funny, the fat, fluffy white birds lying here and there, in yards and on streets coming out no earlier than twilight as they had had while alive, the owls escaped notice. It seems that there are work is not a to Medieval plagues had manifested themselves in a similar way, in the form of many dead rats. This plague, however, had descended from above. After the owls, of course, the other birds followed, but by then, the mystery had been grasped and understood. A meagre colonisation programme had been underway before the war, but now that the sun had ceased to shine on Earth, the colonisation entered an entirely new phase. A connection with this, a weapon of war, the synthetic freedom fighter, had been modified able to function on an alien world, the humanoid robot, strictly speaking, the organic android, had become the mobile donkey engine of the colonization program. Under UN law, each emigrant automatically received possession of an android subtype of, this, of his choice, and by 1990, the variety of subtypes passed all understanding in the manner of American automobiles of the 1960s. That had been the ultimate incentive of emigration. The android servant as carrot, the radioactive fallout as stick. The UN had made it easy to emigrate, difficult, if not impossible, to stay. Loitering on Earth potentially meant finding oneself abruptly classed as biologically unacceptable a menace to the pristine heredity of the race. Once pegged as special, a citizen, even if accepting sterilization, dropped out of history. He ceased, in effect, to be part of mankind. And yet persons here and there declined to migrate. That, even to those involved, constituted a perplexing irrationality. Logically, every regular should have emigrated already. Perhaps deformed as it was, Earth remained familiar, to be clung to. Or possibly the non-emigrant imagined that the tent of dust would deplete itself finally. In any case, thousands of individuals remained, most of them constellated in urban areas where they could physically see one another take heart at their mutual presence. Those appeared to be the relatively sane ones, and in dubious addition to them, occasional peculiar entities 
remained in the virtually abandoned suburbs. John Isidore being yammered at by the television set in his living room as he shaved in the bathroom was one of these. He simply had wandered to this spot in the early days following the war. In those evil times no one had known really what they were doing. Populations detached by the war had roamed squatted temporarily at first one region and then another. Back then the fallout had been sporadic and highly variable. Some states had been nearly free of it, others became saturated. The displaced populations moved as the dust moved. The peninsula south of San Francisco had been at first dust free and a great body of persons had responded by taking up residence there. When the dust arrived, some had died and the rest had departed. J.R. Isidore remained. The TV set shouted, Duplicates, the Hallisian days of the pre-Civil War Southern States either as body servants or tightless field hands, the custom tailored humanoid robot designed specifically for your unique needs, for you and you alone, given to you on your arrival, absolutely free, equipped fully as specified by you before your departure from Earth. This loyal, trouble-free companion in the greatest, boldest adventure contrived by man in modern history will provide it continued on and on i wonder if i'm late for work isidore wondered as he scraped he did not own a working clock generally he depended on the tv for time signals but today was interspace horizons day of evidently anyhow the tv claimed this to be the fifth or sixth anniversary of the founding of New America, the chief US settlement on Mars. And his TV set, being partly broken, picked up only the channel, which had been nationalised during the war and still remained so. The government in Washington, with its colonisation programme, con constituted the sole sponsor which Isidore found himself forced to listen to. Let's hear from Mrs. Maggie Klugman, the TV announcer suggested to John Isidore, who wanted only to know the time. A recent immigrant to Mars, Mrs. Klugman, in an interview taped live in New New York, had this to say. Mrs. Klugman, how would you contrast your life back on contaminated Earth with your new life here in a world rich with every imaginable possibility. A pause, and then a tired, dry, middle-aged female voice said, I think what I and my family of three noticed most was the dignity. The dignity, Mrs. Klugman? The announcer asked. Yes, Mrs. Klugman, now of New New York, Mars said. It's a hard thing to explain. Having a servant you can depend on in these troubled times, I find it reassuring. Back on Earth, Mrs. Klugman, in the old days, did you also worry about finding yourself classified <clears throat> as a special? Oh, my husband and myself worried ourselves nearly to death. Of course, once we emigrated, that worry vanished, fortunately forever. To himself, John Isidore thought acidly, and it's gone away for me too, without my having to emigrate. He had been a special now for over a year and not merely in regard to the distorted genes which he carried. Worse still, he had failed to pass the minimum mental faculties test, which made him, in popular parlance, a chicken head. 
Upon him the contempt of three planets descended. However, despite this, he survived. He had his job, driving a pickup and delivery truck for a false animal repair firm, the Van Ness Pet Hospital and his gloomy Gothic boss Hannibal Sloat accepted him as human, and this he appreciated. Mors Serta Vita Inserta, as Mr Sloat occasionally declared. Isidore, although he had heard the expression a number of times, retained only a dim notion as to its meaning. After all, if a chicken head could fathom Latin, he would cease to be a chicken head. Mr. Sloat, when this was pointed out to him, acknowledged its truth. And there existed chicken heads infinitely stupider than Isidore, who could hold no jobs at all, who remained in custodial institutions quaintly called Institute of Special Trade Skills of America. The word special, having to get in there somehow, as always. Your husband felt no protection, the TV announcer was saying, in owning and continually wearing an expensive and clumsy radiation-proof lead codpiece, Mrs. Klugman. My husband, Mrs. Klugman began. But at that point, having finished shaving, Isidore strode into the living room and shut off the TV set. Silence. 